Welcome to Auburn, Our Story, a series presented by the White River Valley Museum, exploring unique perspectives on our area's extraordinary history. The combination of rich soil and a strong railroad system made the White River Valley an ideal place to farm. Truck farming is a term used to describe raising vegetables and fruits that are harvested by hand and sold at market. Truck farmers usually worked small garden plots of land and supplied the city with fresh produce. Getting produce to market quickly was very important, and besides the canneries, local growers associations and packing companies helped speed the berries, beans, rhubarb, lettuce, and other produce grown in the valley to places around the country. Many truck farmers in the valley were of Japanese descent. In fact, a 1920 census of Christopher, now North Auburn, reported 56 farms being operated by Euro-American farmers and 52 farms being operated by Japanese farmers. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor and subsequent internment of Japanese Americans on the West Coast, the demographics of the valley and the significance of farming forever changed. In this episode, resident Sas Shimojima and former resident Amy Nikaitani recall the days when farming defined the valley. When I think about it, my mother always said uh, she was uh, deceived, you know, because uh, uh, this was the days of the picture brides. And <clears throat> so your wife comes over here and you hold a picture. That's her. And then when the boat comes, you look around and you try to match this picture up, you know. And, and that was, uh, it, it was a picture bride thing. She was, uh, I think she was 15 years younger than my dad. And, and so when she looked at the picture, of him, there was a similarity, but uh, she says, I'm marrying an old man. <laughs> um, my father um, was the oldest in his family, and at that time, you know, Japan was really having a hard time economically, and so my father being the oldest son, um, they borrowed money, and his father brought him to this country to get an education, and he was supposed to go back and support the family. When he was um, about in his early 30s, he had already decided that he lo loved this country and he did not want to go back to Japan to you know, support his family. So by then, he was married. He married my mother, who was a picture bride, and she came... Um, she was living with her brother's family and being a babysitter and, you know, maid of all. And um, she wasn't too happy, so when this offer came from this family friends, she lived in um, Yamaguchi-ken, which is a little ways from Hiroshima-ken, where my father was. And she decided to take up the offer because, he, he, you know, she kind of liked the picture that he sent, which was uh, just a portrait. And um, so she came to this country, and she was a very beautiful woman, and she um, came from a fairly tall family. And so when she saw my father for the first time, she was very disappointed because he was about five feet four. Anyways, and they were married for f maybe about eight years before I was born, and I was the oldest of six. When my parents first came over here, they, uh, uh, well, in my dad's case anyway, when he came over, he came to Burlington up north, and he uh, uh, somehow he learned how to raise potatoes. And so that's what he was doing up in Burlington. <clears throat> And then a couple of his friends came over, and, and this is how these Japanese communities start, you know. And so anyway, a couple of his friends came over, and they wanted to uh, farm together. 
so that they can farm a little bigger. My dad really wanted to be a, uh, a blacksmith, but uh, there was too many blacksmiths around when he came up here. And <clears throat> so he just uh, stuck with farming because he uh, found out that it was pretty good. There were six, six of us uh, kids in the family, besides my parents, and we were all, uh, see, my oldest sisters were, they're 91 now, and uh, so I'm the one, two, three, fourth one in the family, and there's six of us. So we had a pretty good-sized family, but that's the way uh, they planned things, you know, for truck farming. There weren't any what you call really large farmers. They were all more small truck farmers, maybe 10 acres or, you know, about that much. Uh, truck farming is, uh, uh, we call it row crop farming. Uh, that's uh, lettuce, peas, carrots tomatoes, um, celery, and uh, a lot of um, uh, winter crops, which were root crops. So I remember it was cauliflower and lettuce and peas and beans. It, it was easy farming, except, but it's a backbreaker. Well, I feel that at that time when I was growing up, that whole area was more of an agricultural community. The, the farming in the community, uh, that was one of the uh, few trades that the Japanese people were able to go into. And uh, a lot of them worked for railroads and did dairy farming and all this, but uh, the truck farming seemed to be the uh, biggest thing the Japanese people mostly were, you know, into that kind of work. And, you know, it was difficult. None of them got rich off of it, except maybe a couple of families, I don't know. But, um, and then some years, if it rained a lot, the lettuce would, would not be any good, you know. So, and then some farmers, I, re I know of one family where they came late and they got the bad land that was more in a kind of a bottom of a bowl or something, and it would flood every year, and so it was really hard for them. You know, if you had a farmer that was having a hard time, um, we'd uh, try to work together to try to uh, keep them going, and and that's uh, you know you just got to work together, and it starts from families and. Like everything else, they say, you know, it starts from home. Connie is my oldest brother, and then uh, Joe is my youngest brother. And, and, and that's uh, 1920, I think, 1920 tractor. And of course, uh, I think at the time, that was the first tractor that we got. I mean, the, the big tractor. Um, and uh, they all had pads on it like that because of being in peat ground. During the winter, we had uh, pieces that we bolted on there so that we made them wider. And in the summertime, we narrow, took that off, and then we'd narrow it down. We, we knew where the spots were where it was extra muddy, and if a horse got stuck, you, you had to work fast, and we had tripods made. And we'd take a tripod out there, and uh, we have a chain hoist. It isn't a chain, a rope hoist on it, and we'd uh, help the horse up, 
And then as we got the horse up, because you had to get their belly off the ground. And once you got the horse up far enough, then you can just keep putting planks under the horse, and the horse would finally work its way out. But uh, we probably used to do that maybe uh, once, twice a week. Our ground was uh, uh, peat ground, which uh, is that black, uh, black soil, but it's easy to work. And uh, the advantage we had was we could get three crops a year off of the same piece of ground where uh, other places, they can get some places to only one crop and some two crops a year. But uh, that's why uh, we had uh, work all year round. Winter time was when we used to prepare our seeds and uh, we used to have hotbeds and uh, later on, uh, people, some of them had greenhouses, but uh, we had hotbeds, and we were, uh, usually the, during the winter, the girls did that. My two oldest sisters, who were twins, uh, them and uh, my mother used to do all the transplanting, which... Uh, we had little sheds that uh, they worked uh, in so that they'd be out of the weather, and they would plant the seeds and place them. And actually, we had to transplant them twice uh, before uh, we uh, planted out in the field because uh, that was the only way that you could do it so that you're crops would come out at the same time. A greenhouse is a glorified hotbed. Yeah, because, they, see, they had the, the hotbed is a, just a concentrated part of the greenhouse, and then in the greenhouse you have the little beds where they, they stand up and do their transplanting. But uh, in a green uh, hotbed, you're out in the open, so you just build a shed around it, and you move the shed. And then people got ideas, and they just... Uh, you, you never heard of a place having 10 acres under glass, but you go to California and you'll see it. Uh, we used to um, prepare our crop the day before, and we'd get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to bring it into Seattle. And uh, we weren't at Pike Place Market. We were down below there on Western Avenue. And they were all, uh, they used to call them commission houses. And we'd bring our produce in there. And then they would go ahead and sell it from there. And all we did, we just brought it in and left it up to them to uh, sell it for us. And if there was any uh, leftover stuff that had to go out, uh, we always picked it up the next time that we were in town. When, uh, when my older brother was 16, I think, uh, was when he first started driving into Seattle. And... In those days, you know, traffic wasn't so heavy. So, and 3 o'clock in the morning, there's not much traffic on the road. So we had a pretty good time of uh, going in. But there was always two of us went. And uh, one of us uh, is a driver. And then uh, the other one would just go ahead and uh, be the swamper. Swamper is really... Somebody that does the dirty work. Yeah, uh, because a truck driver, all he does is just drive truck. But uh, in my brother's case, 
with us, it was more we had to work together because uh, we weren't big enough to do it by ourselves, and that's why my dad always sent me along. And the other thing was, <clears throat> in those days, we had our trucks didn't have air brakes. In fact, we didn't have hydraulic brakes. We, we had mechanical brakes. And so my brother would be sitting over here driving the truck, and then the, the brake pedal was always over here on the right side. So I'm, I'm sitting over there, and when he has to make a quick stop, he pushes a foot brake down, and I pull the hand brake. And so in emergency, you can stop then. And that's what uh, my, my deal was mainly to help my, dad, my brother when he has to make a quick stop, that he's going to be stepping on a foot brake, and so I'm holding, I'll pull this one back, and that'll give him that much more braking power. And we, we've had to use it a lot. A lot of this uh, truck farming, the farmers all had, uh, they formed associations. And, and this was uh, from necessity. It, they had to have a, a way to market your crops and uh, like right in Auburn, we had uh, three, two or three uh, uh, packing houses where we would bring our crops there, and then they would take care of it. E.K. Saito, who was running the White River Packing Company, was looking for a bilingual person that could run his office operations. And so my father decided to take that job. And... His job was to run the office, and he had a bookkeeper under him, you know, and he did all the paperwork, and he made sure that the... I remember the bills of lading that they needed for each car that was shipped um, had to be taken to the railroad every time they had some. And then I remember that he was responsible for seeing that all the bills were paid. And um, that was pretty much his job, I guess, running the office. Mm -hmm. And so he had a, a car, we had a passenger car, which the company supplied, and we'd get a new one every five years or so, which was something in those days. You know, my mother had a washing machine, and, and we had indoor plumbing, and, you know, so I guess we had it pretty good, actually, yeah. Well, I would call this a lettuce packing shed, you know, it was the White River Packing Company. And... Um, the lettuce would be brought in from the fields, and some farmers had their own trucks, and they would truck it in. Other farmers, the company had trucks, and they would, you know, uh, truck it in for the farmers. And uh, the lettuce was brought into the shed, and then they had this kind of a production line. I always think of the Link Belt Company. I remember the big Link Belt Company because I think that's what made it possible. They had, like, um, uh, rollers that would, you know, move the boxes along. And then they had this a belt-like thing that had stoppers on it on the ground for the lettuce culls to be trimmed and dumped there. And then they would um, put it on this table for the packers to pack these into boxes. The first thing that they did with these boxes on the production line was to, they had uh, two shelves of parchment paper. And they would put these parchment papers that were kind of a light brown color into the box, you know, this way, and then they turned the box the other way. And then he would put them on the rollers to go to the packers. Beside the packer, there was a bin of crushed ice. And so he would put in a row of lettuce, and then he would put in some crushed ice and another row of lettuce and so forth. And then he would cover up with this paper. And then it would go on these rollers down to the labeler. And the labeler uh, had to make this bucket of paste from flour. And then he would take this brush and he would, um, you know, brush the side of the box where the label went and slap the label on. And then it would go to the person that put the lid on and hammered it down. And then it would go into the boxcar. 
and the box cars are refrigerated and they put these big blocks of ice in from the top on each end and then they were closed and shipped. For the lettuce festival, I remember that the packing company would submit floats. And one float was a big, the biggest lettuce salad in the world or something, and they had this big bowl, you know, and they had all the local beauties in bathing suits t mixing the salad. Okay, and then I remember this other one that I participated in, and they made this great big round globe out of lettuce and cauliflower, with the cauliflower being the land masses. And then they had this big hole on top, for Uncle Sam and a Japanese girl to be up there on the top. And Chuck Furuta was Uncle Sam. He was kind of tall and gangly. And I was a Japanese girl. And I was in a kimono and I, you know, waved to the crowd. Yeah. It, it, everything we did was kind of, um, it was all teamwork because we each had our own chores out we had to take care of. So it, it was uh, pretty good because um, if, if it was a time of the year when you know, there was a lot of daylight, uh, we, we had to uh, work it. But uh, we'd, uh, some days when, uh, especially when the, you know, it's, it's harvest time, uh, Sometime we'd start uh, working in the morning, maybe uh, uh, five, six o'clock in the morning, we'd get up and go out there and we'd uh, work and get our crops out before it got too hot. Usually in the afternoon, we kind of had a free time where we could go out in the field and we can play football or play baseball or whatever, you know, and, and most of the kids around the neighborhood, we'd get together and we'd uh, do that. But uh, later on, you know, as the, the years went by, our folks used to uh, encourage us to play, you know, uh, basketball, football, whatever sport was out at the time. And that kept us all from uh, getting in trouble. My father was there at least 12 years, you know, from the first grade till I graduated high school. Then, then the war started in 41 when I graduated. So, yeah, at least that long and probably more. At the outbreak of the war, it was uh, uh, bad because uh, when the war broke out, it was in, in December, and the government says uh, to go ahead and farm as if you were going to be here. And so the farmers just, uh, I guess they really had no choice. Um, we didn't know what was coming, and so we, we had to go ahead and do things uh, the way they had arranged it so that we just kept farming just like we was going to uh, harvest it. And I know... Uh, when we had to evacuate here, uh, it was in May, and uh, May 1942, and our crops at that time, I think we had uh, 10 acres of lettuce that was ready to harvest the day that we left. And what do you do? You know, I would say that um, lettuce farming was pretty much at its peak at that time because there were at least there was a shed in Auburn that whatever packing company had, as well as the one in Kent, and then there was a hog plant, and the one that there was the the young you know f farmers themselves were starting, which was more of a co-op, and that was on the Milwaukee Railroad track. So I would say that it was really at its peak, and then that was it, you know. I don't know what happened after that, but I don't think that it was the same after that, after the Japanese left the valley. But today, when, when you look at things, it was hard work, but uh, 
I don't know, uh, we just had fun doing it because we, we didn't uh, really make work out of it because we had our, you know, regular breaks and we used to have uh, a little fun doing it even. For more historical views of Auburn, come see us at the White River Valley Museum at 918 H Street in the Lesco of Community Campus or you can visit us online at www.wrvmuseum.org. The museum is open Wednesday through Sunday from 12 to 4 p.m. Call us at 253-288-7433 for more information. Thanks for watching. Please join us again for another unique perspective on Auburn, our story. With every passing moment, history is made. What will yours be?